Hey everybody! I think it's time we did something spooky again. Today we're gonna dabble in a bit of the old Lovecraftian stuff with Frogware's hard to find game, The Sinking City. The Sinking City was that other Lovecraft game we all heard about after the most recent video game to call itself Call of Cthulhu came out, but a lot of us wrote it off when it was initially an EGS timed exclusive. Then when it came time to see how it was on Steam or other platforms, it just wasn't there. It wasn't even on EGS anymore. The game had seemingly disappeared from the face of the internet to the uninformed gamer. Before we unravel the mystery of The Sinking City, let's give a little love to today's sponsor, Opera GX. Opera GX is the world's first browser for gamers being tailored for the gaming community and is extremely useful for gaming thanks to GX Control. What's that you say? GX Control is a built-in system that lets you limit your bandwidth, CPU, and GPU usage of any given tab or the browser as a whole so it doesn't impact your gaming experience. To compare how much RAM Opera GX uses to, say, Chrome, I opened the same 10 tabs on both Opera GX and Chrome, where Chrome took about 1.7 to 1.8 gigabytes of RAM just to keep these tabs idling. Opera GX was sitting at around 1.3 to 1.4 gigs of RAM, and that was before I did any sort of limiting in GX Control. In the sake of fairness, I do run a couple extensions on my Chrome, but mainly an ad blocker for when I'm browsing untrusted sites to prevent them from running scripts on me. An ad blocker is already baked into Opera GX, so that's kind of a non-issue. Doing this comparison also made me really appreciate that GX Control just gives you a straight answer as to how much resources that the browser is using. It was like pulling teeth to get a final total out of Google Chrome, and I ironically had to download another extension to figure out what my running total was because for some reason Chrome's task manager doesn't let you see that. If that wasn't enough for you, you can integrate your favorite music player such as Spotify, Apple Music, or YouTube Music directly into your sidebar with the GX player. You can also do the same with your Twitch and Discord accounts so you can get notified when your favorite streamer goes live without having to ogle the Twitch homepage for hours on end. You can even customize the color layout any which way you'd like with all the pretty colors and more. Go on and give Opera GX a try by clicking the link in the description to download the browser and be sure to tell me in the comments about your gaming experience while using Opera GX. So today's game, The Seeking City, is a third-person detective game with a bit of action here and there that's set in the open world of Oak Haven, Massachusetts, which is steeped in the Cthulhu mythos. You play as one Detective Charles Reed, who on top of hitting that checkbox that he's a detective, had a stint in a mental asylum after things got bad during World War I, and sees otherworldly visions, making him the perfect protagonist for a Lovecraft-inspired video game. You show up at Oak Haven by boat, and after having a hard time finding the place, since it isn't really on any maps for some reason, and you find that the whole place got severely flooded recently and is now infested with mysteries for you to solve and monsters for you to shoot at in vain before realizing you just gotta run away. Shenanigans ensue. So you're saying to yourself, that all sounds pretty familiar. But I never got around to playing it, and then when I tried to, I found out the game wasn't available on Steam or Epic anymore. Well, after the initial release, Frogwares entered a dispute with their at-the-time publisher, Big Ben Interactive, now known as Nacon. As Frogware tells it on their website, Nacon was regularly late with payments for their development milestones, with the payments being over a month late on average, and they wouldn't give them any information about sales projections or stuff like that. Things came to a head when Nacon had another studio start working on a Lovecraftian-inspired game, and they wanted Frogwares to hand over the source code for The Sinking City, which they had no right to ask for as they were merely licensing the game to be released on various platforms, not owners of the IP, as Frogwares tells it. After Frogwares said no to that request, BBI, or Nacon, just stopped paying them for anything, including sales royalties, and tried to ice Frogwares out, forcing Frogwares to have the game pulled from storefronts that Nacon was licensed to sell the Sinking City on and to file a lawsuit for breach of contract. In the meantime, the Sinking City eventually was briefly up for sale again on the Steam storefront, but... Frogwares alleges that this was Nacon uploading a cracked copy of the game to the storefront to try and sell us their own, and they even tampered with a few of the game title screens to try and hide this, and further alleging that they cracked the complete edition of the Sinking City, which contained DLC that Nacon did not have publishing rights to in the first place. This telling of events is based on Frogwares' perspective of things according to the dev blogs, and Frogwares presents a whole lot of evidence backing up these allegations on said dev blog. Frogwares sent a DMC 
DMCA complaint to Steam, which Steam immediately complied with, leaving the game missing from the Steam storefront once again. Recent blog posts on Frogware's website state that the lawsuit with Big Ben Interactive, or Nacon, is still going on, which makes sense to me because it was filed in mid-2020, and to go from complaint to judgment in a span of 12 to 18 months would be considered really really fast. Regardless, you can still find Sinking City for sale here, and I was able to get my hands on it for this video legitimately. In the sake of fairness here and making sure everyone gets represented, Big Ben Interactive slash Nacon denied all the initial accusations leveled at them by Frogwares, and according to various gaming news articles and Nacon's own press release, while the Paris Court of Appeals is still adjudicating like what's gonna happen with the suit overall, they made an enforceable decision which as I quote here, the Frogwares terminated the contract in a manifestly unlawful manner and as a result ordered as a precautionary measure the continuation of the contract dot 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 until its term or a decision is made on the breach of this contract and ordered Frogwares Ireland to refrain from any action on the breach of this contract and ordered Frogwares Ireland to refrain from any action that impedes its continuation dot 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 and that's where the case is sitting right now until like they could do, I guess, proper litigation and have a fully binding judgment. So this is a big, we'll see. One last thing worth noting here is that after the allegations came out from Frogwares about them pirating the game to resell it on the Steam storefront, uh, they didn't even like give an answer. Like, they declined to comment about that when pressed, and when I try to go to the uh, Nacon press release that was linked in various gaming articles about this whole kerfuffle, I get a big fat 404, so I got nothing for you there, I'm sorry. All that being covered though, let's talk about the Sinking City's gameplay. The Sinking City is an open world mystery solver. An open world means you gotta find stuff before you can solve stuff. If you happen to be one of those Morrowind supremacists who thinks that RPGs peaked at giving you a wall of text with vague instructions as to where you're supposed to go, you'll love the Sinking City's means of giving you your quest objectives. You're usually given a clue you need to deduce, and then when you've figured it out, you can either head out to where you think the next step is gonna be, or if you wanna stay sane, you can take your deduction and pin it on a part of the map where you think the next thing most likely is. The Sinking City is pretty good about you being able to mark your map with individual objectives, quest objectives, and other notes, which is very helpful as the locals of Oakhaven care not for the comfort of outsiders and don't bother with numbered street addresses. Like the game straight up tells you this. The majority of the locals in Oakhaven don't like you since you're not from around these parts and will usually be difficult or at the very least very rude to you. Oakhaven is pretty big and also partially underwater now, but lucky for you, you're given plenty of ways to get around the namesake Sinking City. The first and most obvious way is just running around everywhere, which can take quite a while and is pretty limited since while you can try and swim across like certain gaps or flooded areas, the big ol' eels that are native to the waters of Oak Haven don't care how much of a strong swimmer Reed is. They're hungry. Also, there's how the man in the yellow suit, Johannes Vanderberg, who greets you at the beginning of the game, always seems to be exactly where he needs to be for the plot, and he's given you a little motorboat that has the same abilities. The boat handles like, well, a boat. And the canals aren't exactly clear of debris or other obstacles, so it's gonna take a bit of finessing, but you can easily get around with just walking and having the boat show up exactly where you need it to be. Finally, you've got good old fashioned fast travel. If you keep your eyes open and look for little compass marks on your HUD, you'll find that phone booths that act as fast travel points. Okay, it is big enough to necessitate these and you'll be very thankful for them later in the game when the quests start taking you back and forth across the map. These are especially helpful thanks to the state of repair that Okaven is in and sometimes roads are just blocked off, infested with monsters and effectively a no-go zone for you in the earlier parts of the game. Or you might just be in an older part of the city that doesn't have too much urban planning going on so walking around will get complicated. The downside to using the fast travel is that one, you gotta find the phone booths first before you can use them and some of them are a little hard to notice. And two, if you lean too heavily on it, you'll never come across abandoned buildings that you'll need to scavenge for side quests or for ever important scavenging as there aren't any stores open right 
now. And even if they were, the locals don't seem like they want to do business with outsiders like you. So once you can find your way across the city, you can start doing some proper sleuthing. Once you've cleared out any spookies hanging out in an area, you've got to look for potential clues and then give enough meaning to said clues to make deductions that will lead you closer to the conclusion of the case you're working on. Be prepared to comb the building looking for anything out of place or a hidden letter somewhere and talk to anyone hanging around or outside of the place who might have seen something important. Something that Reed has at his disposal is his spooky vision, which is something we've seen a lot of in games that have enhanced vision for detective mode. The Sinking Cities is a bit more tasteful than over the head because you can't use it for general sleuthing. Your spooky vision is useful for picking up on the signs left by vagrants that mark doors where you can enter things or what you can loot, which I believe you can even turn that off in the difficulty settings, but I just played on normie default difficulty, so I don't know. I will say, however, that towards the third part of the game, I didn't even really need to use the spooky vision to spot the symbols that mark a door I can enter or a container I can loot, because after a while, you just get really good at spotting the things you can loot. Spooky vision is instead used for things like detecting illusory walls, sensing memories attached to certain objects to get a clear picture of how they were used in a certain event, and eventually, once you've found all the key evidence in an area, you can use spooky vision to enter a little vision quest to let you reconstruct what went down at a crime scene before you got there, where you'll have to figure out what happened when to get an idea of where to go next to solve the case. You also can't run while using your spooky vision, and it drains your sanity so you can't use it continuously. I'm okay with that as it helps avoid the Batman Arkham game syndrome, where you just spend the whole game in detective mode and miss out on a lot of the stuff that the devs worked hard on. Once you figure out all the evidence in an area and have an idea of where to go next, that doesn't necessarily mean you've got a bead on exactly where to go. Often you'll deduce something along the lines of a general idea of what you need to be looking for, and you'll need to go do some research. Then you'll head to the various archives, such as City Hall, the hospital, the local newspaper, or the police station to name a few. There you'll have to reference whatever lead you've got against search criteria from four major topics, each with their own set of subtopics. Yes, you can try to brute force it, but it's almost always faster to just apply a bit of critical thinking here, and there's also a chance that if you go by this method, you'll likely just go to an area that isn't even the right set of archives in the first place. An example of how this all works is that at one point, you deduce that you need to track down a certain person who gave witness testimony against you. Unfortunately, this person is known to be scarce and frequently on the move. However, he's also presently running for mayor of Oak Haven. Based on that information, you can head down to the local newspaper and check their archives for recent interviews of candidates for political office, where you'll find an approximation of this man's last known location. I'm personally all about this stuff because it's almost like I was able to find work within the realm of what I went to school for. Finally, you've got the Mind Palace, which is where all the vital pieces of information you learn on a case are kept track of, and a stark reminder that Frogwares is first and foremost a Sherlock Holmes factory. Here is where you put one and one together to deduce vital clues or find out where you you need to go next when no one thing from the previous investigation site leads to the next step in a case. You'll have to make a few judgment calls here based on what you think happened, and the outcome of a case can vary based on what you choose to believe happened based on the evidence you've collected. Sometimes you'll make a choice and the evidence just won't add up, but then when you re-examine your choices and change one around, you might find that everything now falls into place with this new line of reasoning. The final deductions aren't binding as to what you must do to resolve the mystery at hand though, but are more of a good indication of what you should do given what's been presented to you. You. Between sleuthing and puttering around in your little motorboat, you'll need to keep yourself well supplied if you want to survive in Oak Haven. Things have gotten so bad with the flood and complete lack of government aid since it seems no one is able to find the place, Oak Haven has abandoned the dollar entirely and has returned to a barter system for goods and services. The primary thing that people trade with is bullets since most of those are a surefire way to keep the monsters away. You won't be doing any real shopping though for previously mentioned reasons about the locals not liking you, but instead be getting paid with ammunition that you're gonna need if you want to survive. Lucky for you, it's entirely feasible to craft your own health kits, traps, and ammunition for your guns by scavenging scraps around the destroyed homes in Oak Haven. And I guess Detective Reed just has a reloading bench somewhere on his person too? It, it's video game. There's all sorts of abandoned areas around the city you can duck into to scrounge for shell casings and powder, along with anything else you might need to keep yourself stocked up. Quest specific areas will likely have a whole lot of stuff in abandoned lockers and strongboxes, and and if you're feeling real brave, you can go into one of those infested areas where there's
there's a ton of stuff just sitting around on the street, but also it's called the infested areas for a reason. It's a better idea to wait till much later in the game if you want to spend any longer than a minute in these places. And that brings us to the shooties. You have get all the weapons that you'd expect to have in a video game, plus some throwables and basic traps. You've got what kind of looks like a Colt 1911 chamber for 38 according to the bullets you pick up. Even though the game says it's an M11, which according to a Google search is the military designation for a 6 hour P226, which would have fired 9 by 19 millimeter rounds instead of 38 super and wouldn't be invented for another 60 years after the events of this game. It additionally doesn't make much sense as the flavor text says re keeps whatever this 38 firing pistol actually is for concealability reasons, but the 1911 is known for being a big boy among pistols. It could be that Frogware is intended to call this an M1911, but couldn't call it that for intellectual property reasons, so they shorted it to M11 without realizing that that's the name of another gun. Maybe I'm just reading too much into this after watching a few too many Forgotten Weapons videos. You've also got a 44 revolver, a shotgun, a single shot rifle, and that good old fashioned Chicago typewriter. So something that's going to be clear to you early on in the game is that while Reed is a decent shot, he's not a super commando. Even with a baked in aim assist, which you can turn off by the way, your shots are going to go roughly into the crosshairs, but you're not going to have pinpoint accuracy, and most of the things you'll be shooting at aren't going to go down from a couple well placed shots. Most of the game you'll find that you're better off just running away from anything bigger than one of those spitter guys unless you absolutely need to be in an area for a story related case. Outside of the shooties, you've got your traps, skills, and your sanity. Traps are pretty straightforward. You've got a bear trap like thing, a firebomb, and a makeshift grenade. You can craft all of these and there are skills associated with them such as being able to hold more of them or craft them more efficiently. Then you've got your skill points which you'll get by collecting evidence, closing cases, and killing baddies. Although I really wouldn't rely on the latter since that's a good way to lose all your stuff. There's no hard stat increases you get just for leveling up, but if you're smart and pick the skill points that net you more XP and reward drops early on, you'll be swimming in skill points and gear by mid game as levels don't scale up as you go. It's always going to be a thousand experience points per level every level, so you can get a lot of skill points really fast. Finally, you've got your sanity, which you're going to need to take care of. Having a monster jump out at you, seeing macabre things like dead people, or witnessing eldritch magic such as illusory walls will make your sanity take a hit, and if it gets too low, you'll have to start fighting hallucinations which can deal real damage to you, or worse, if your sanity hits zero, that's essentially the same as your health hitting zero. To keep your sanity up, you've got to A. Don't look at the spooky thing for any longer than you have to. B, make sure you have a sanity bracer handy in case a big squid thing jumps out at you, and it's not too hard to do, and I never suffered a sanity death during my playthrough of this video. Well folks, it's time we begin the ritual to please the dinnertime eldritch beings. Today we're going to be doing something a lot of you have seen me do on my YouTube stories. A whole roast chicken. Here's what you're going to need. A dead bird. Butter that's at room temperature. Cooking twine. An onion. A head of garlic. Herbs and spices. A casserole dish. An El Horno preheated to 350 units of caliente. Acquire your dead bird as fresh as possible, but do it at the store. And then thoroughly wash it, inside and out, in the sink. Be careful cleaning the interior of the bird as there are bones inside of that cavity that'll stick your fingers pretty bad if you're going too fast. Thoroughly pat your bird dry with paper towels and then place it on a rack with some more paper towels to have it dry out some more. Liberally salt the bird because we want to get as much excess moisture out of this thing as possible. This is especially important if you're getting a cheapo bird that comes in a bag or frozen because those usually have a ton of excess water pumped into them to make them seem bigger and juicier than they actually are. So if you don't take care of this, you'll be left with a bird that shrinks to half its size after cooking and ends up being extremely soggy thanks to being flooded by all the extra juices slipping out during cooking. Make sure to salt all sides of the bird, including the insides of the wings and thighs, and then let the salt do its thing for about 20 to 30 minutes. This would be a good time to prep any sides you want to make. I'm going for mashed potatoes and steamed veggies here. After about 20 minutes, you'll notice what looks like beads of sweat, and that's exactly what we want. Thoroughly pat the bird dry again with paper towels and get it ready for El Horno. Get your half stick of butter and then just smear it all over that bird, top and bottom, in inside and out. This will get easier the more you do it, but don't be stingy here. You need to get a good layer of freedom all over that bird. Now, take your onion and cut it into quarters if you were able to find a small onion, or if you were like me and the store only had large onions in stock, just take half of a large onion and then cut that half into fourths. Also, take your bulb of garlic and just cut it right down the middle. These are going to be your aromatics that'll help keep the bird nice smelling and also the right kind of juicy, so just go ahead and stuff them right into that orifice. Now it's time to tie the thing up. I 
just use about an arm span's length of twine since it's better to have too much than too little. Do little loops around each of the legs and then go over and under, back and forth around the bird, making sure that the legs are thoroughly tied down and that everything is being held in place before you tie off the ends. If you notice that some of the butter is coming off the bird, just rub it back on. Now we can season the bird. Add some more salt if you dabbed off too much when you uh, did the paper towel things and then put on some pepper and your herbs. Now usually I'm just a fresh rosemary guy, but the store only had it in these variety packs, so that's what I'm using today. And after this, I'd say I'm definitely still more of a rosemary with a sprinkling of parsley and basil as compared to whatever this little mix is. Regardless, tuck your sprigs of herbs under the twine to keep them in place and then do the smart thing and put any of the herbs you wanted to put on the bottom of the bird at the bottom of the casserole dish and place the bird on top of it instead of accidentally overhandling your bird. Okay, it's time to sacrifice this raw bird to El Horno. Place the bird in the casserole dish and then cover the dish in tin foil while poking a few holes in it so that excess steam can escape. Slide the whole ritual into El Horno and then we're gonna get the first round of cooking done. Cook times for whole chickens are all over the place with some places saying as little as 15 minutes per pound and some places saying 25 to 30 plus minutes per pound. Since this bird is stuffed, we're gonna be doing at least 20 minutes per pound since we're cooking on a low and slow temperature for juiciness. Plus we're gonna cook it some more later on at a higher temperature. On top of keeping this bird juicy, another reason we cook low and slow here is because we thoroughly buttered up this bird and butter has a pretty low smoke point thanks to its milk content. If you tried to do a fast cook like this, you'd end up with a kitchen full of smoke and an awkward like smoke alarm going off. I've got myself a big honking six pounder of a bird here, so it's gonna take me a whole two hours to get through the first phase of cooking. After the first cooking session, take it out and you'll notice that it's pale looking, clammy, and clearly not up to temp. That's because we're not done cooking it yet. Take the foil cover up, crank El Horno up to 425 or 450 units of freedom, and then throw it back in there for at least 30 more minutes. This is gonna finish up the bird and get the skin all nice and browned up. And we can do this because the butter is now kind of clarified thanks to most of the milk stuff cooking off. And now that'll resist up to about 485 degrees of Fahrenheit. After at least 30 minutes, pull the bird out, temp it at its thickest point, which is between the thigh and the breast, and make sure it rests for at least 10 minutes before you cut into it. Now would be a good time to work on your sides. Although it probably would have been better to start on your sides after putting the bird back in the oven. And please learn from my mistakes, folks. So once it's time to cut the bird up, you'll notice it's really soft and parts of it are pretty much falling off the bone. This can be a bit of a pain when you're trying to carve it in a certain way, or if you just suck like I do. And I'd suggest looking up a tutorial or two on carving a roast chicken, because I'll be honest here, I'm not doing a very good job. Same goes for my sides. I kind of botched them in the process of getting the timing right, thanks to getting nervous when I do things for camera. One last thing I will suggest for you to do is for your breast cuts, go only about halfway deep for the sake of having a manageable piece to serve, and then toss whatever you're not going to immediately eat in the fridge. Come back in an hour or so when it's all cooled off to safely handle, and then pick off the scraps of meat from the chicken and store it in a container instead of on the bird. This is not only much better at saving fridge space, but also some of the best chicken sandwiches and salads you can make are going to come from the picked chicken of leftover whole roasted birds. Now that we've had ourselves a nice meal, let's do some spookies. So first and foremost in the areas of spookies in the sinking city is the Kofuhu mythos. There's a lot of stuff going on under the surface of Oakhaven, literally. You'll be frequently made to go on diving missions that leave you defenseless against all sorts of deep sea entities, some of which are too much for you to even look at. There's also a bit of the Innsmouth flavor of Lovecraft at play here, is that there's a large influx of Innsmouth refugees living in Oakhaven after an event that's not given too much attention in the story, but the end result was that Innsmouth was destroyed and all the Innsmouthers had to go somewhere. I gotta say this is probably one of the best depictions of how people from Innsmouth might look, or as the game calls it, Innsmouth Syndrome. It's creepy, but distinctly human enough for you to realize that the Innsmouthers are at least partially human, but clearly something else too. If you know your Lovecraft, you know what's up here. Then there's all the things that'll make your sanity take a hit. All the enemies in the Sinking City are designed to be spooky in one way or another, from the basic starter enemy that you'll be able to one-shot with your melee attack is basically a a bunch of inhuman looking hands trying to grab you. The spitter enemies turn out to have been human at some point and they want to do whatever happened to them to you. And then there's how that big old tanky enemy is basically an amalgamation of corpses that will create more flesh monsters to attack you. You'll also find yourself in for some surprises, like how using your true sight on some of the angel statues at a local church reveals that those aren't even biblical depictions of angels. Then there's your encounters with actual eldritch entities instead of just their byproducts and the cultists that worship them. Now the cultists in general won't be too much of a shock because as you might have noticed, there's a lot of normal people dressed up like eldritch entities 
entity worshippers just going about their business in town, not harming anyone. So when you meet some that actually want you dead, it's kind of jarring. Then, when you see the thing that they're worshipping, you'll get the idea. These guys are the extremists. There'll be a few occasions where you'll be faced with something that's beyond the scope of weird fleshy monsters and more along the lines of the things that are older than civilization, and they don't seem to be very fond of your presence or even your existence. So, don't even try, just get out of there fast. Then there's how Oakhaven is a generally creepy place. Thanks to the flood, it's mostly rundown streets lined with dilapidated buildings and poorly lit areas. You'll also find that a lot of the creepy stuff among the not eldritch entity worshipping citizens are around, such as some pretty alarming stuff in the asylum, various occult artifacts, and other non eldritch entity worshipping cults that are just as messed up as general. Not to mention all the terrible visions of death and doom you're getting while you're here that seem to be amplified by whatever is going on underneath Oak Haven. Let's take the time to get a bit more into the premise and the story of Sinking City. Detective Charles Reed served as a Navy diver aboard the USS Cyclops during World War I, and something went very, very bad, resulting in the sinking of the ship. He's not really sure what happened, though. He does have a recurring memory, or perhaps a vision, of him touching some sort of stone after washing ashore, and then things got weird. Since then, he's done a stint in the asylum after receiving visions of doom, creepy monsters, and all sorts of things you'd prefer not to have in your mind's eye, but they have this fringe benefit of letting him see memories attached to certain objects, which makes him a very good detective. Reed learns about the city of Oakhaven, which has many people experiencing what he experiences, and there might be some people there that have answers for him. He has a hard time getting there, though, as it seems that while Oakhaven is in Massachusetts, it isn't on any maps, and only one boat was able to take him there. When Reed finally does get to Oakhaven, it's in pretty bad shape thanks to a freak flood taking out most of the city, and he arrives to a fresh murder case as it appears that a local expedition that went to figure out what's going on with the ocean near Oakhaven went completely nuts. It's a Lovecraft inspired story, you know where this is all going, but all in due time. So the majority of the major players in Oakhaven are from what are called the Grand Families. The Throgmortons, who serve as your inn to the insular community of Oakhaven, the Carpenters, and the elusive Blackwoods that have ties to the March family from Innsmouth. Yeah, those marshes. There are a few non-affiliated parties, such as Johannes Vanderberg, who's always in yellow and always seems to be where he needs to be for the action, and the EOD, who claim that their group is called Everyone's Obvious Duty. Right. So the main quest will have you going back and forth between the grand families doing one errand after another that brings you closer to understanding the truth about what the heck is going on with you and this entire city. These main quests are also how you'll be introduced to the existence of other factions in Oakhaven and how you get your weapons. After solving the murder of the Throgmorton patron's son, you'll be made to try and infiltrate the EOD to try and figure out what happened to the lead researcher of the expedition that the Throgmorton patriarch sent his son on and maybe she'll be able to shed some light about what's going on with the sea around Oakhaven, but along the way you'll get passed back and forth between every other major family to get what you need. As previously mentioned, there are a lot of choices you can make in the Mine Palace that can affect the world of Oakhaven. Most of the major quests will have a major choice you can make regarding who you want to help, who gets to live, and what's going to be available to you after all the dust is settled. Not all of these are going to have a huge impact on the game though, but it's nice that you're allowed to be the decider here or that even if all the clues add up to one conclusion, you don't necessarily have have to narc on someone because maybe there's a good reason for things happening the way they did. Along the way, there's quite a few pretty good side quests to do. These aren't as rewarding as the main quests, and there's a lot of pretty cool stories centered around them, like helping the Frog Mortons find a special mirror, helping the town doctor do some research on the monsters that have been appearing everywhere, and figuring out where all the patients of the asylum are disappearing to. I'd go as far to say that the same level of effort that was put into the main quest line also went into most of the side quests. Everything in the Sinking City is fully voice acted, and the majority of it is really good. It's a nice break from some of the other Lovecraft inspired games I've been playing lately. Okay, spoiler time. You know what to do. So, as you help the Throgmortons find out what happened to their expedition, you learn that the expedition found something called the Seal, which makes all of them go nuts, and then you get attacked by Innsmouthers, who you learn kidnapped the lead researcher of the expedition for their own purposes. Whatever she learned, it's important. You help out the local charity group, who seems to have her for some reason, and they're willing to let you in if you do some favors for them. Surprise, surprise, the EOD is actually the Esoteric Order of Dagon, and they've got big plans, including seeing you dead for interfering. You eventually learn that the reason that you have the visions is because you're one of the Chosen, people who have the power to either open or close the gates of Katiganar at the end of the cycle, which is coming up soon. This also means that you can safely interface with that seal that people found earlier, and use it when the time 
time comes. You also learn that Vanderberg is a lot more than he seems and that he has an interest in you opening the gate to wake the dreamer and ending the cycle entirely, taking all of humanity with it. He also faked his own death and had you framed for his murder, which was kind of a dick move. You eventually learn that the Blackwoods knew about all of this through their Marsh connection, and they all literally crawl back into the ocean, save for that extra weird one that you have to deal with. He's weird because he spent his whole life being told that he was one of the chosen and was trained to restart the cycle, but it turned out that it wasn't the case and he's just a normie. You can have him try to take the seed that makes you a chosen from you and put it in himself, but that ritual doesn't go so well, so it looks like you're gonna have to be the one that does the choosing. So you go and look up an archaeologist to get some leads on where the gate of Tkitiganar might be, and he introduces you to an immortal priestess who tells you how to do the whole cycle thing. You collect all the name brand peripherals for the seal and then head off to the bottom of the ocean to perform the ritual and decide the fate of all humanity. You can choose to either restart the cycle by giving your own life, guaranteeing humanity's existence for another few hundred years, opening the gates and joining the dreamer, ending the world, or you can just walk away from the whole thing, but then a few years later Vanderberg meets you at a bar and the world ends anyway. What's nice is that you also don't need to play the whole game over again if you want to see all of these endings. One last thing we're going to talk about here before we wrap up this big old world of Oakhaven is that Frogwares left a ton of cool little Easter eggs everywhere. I won't tell you all the ones I saw because it's kind of fun finding them yourself, but a few really good examples are that a street you'll be going up and down a lot of is called Dunsany Road. Lord Dunsany was a Victorian fantasy writer whose works inspired H.P. Lovecraft. There's also one you might see a lot of, which is a poster for Sherlock Holmes in the Mystery of the Creepy Watson, which is a reference to a game Frogwares made back in 2007 that had Watson always appear behind the player character with a very unsettling result, which made it a bit of a meme back in the early days of YouTube. Another one that I really liked is that when you're going after the KKK to find one of the Blackwoods, you find an arrest record stating that one Z.H. Comstock was arrested for clan-related activities but was let go when his supporters demanded his freedom. Now where have we heard that name before? In closing, I'd say that The Sinking City is one of the better Lovecraft-inspired games, even if at times it's a bit rough around the edges thanks to it being hard to patch because of that whole licensing thing. It took me just under 18 hours to get through the game, and I was playing at a pretty brisk pace. I'm sure you could stretch that out a bit more if you wanted to be a completionist. I'm also a fan of this whole mystery-solving aspect that Frogwares has been nailing down since, like, 2002, and I just remembered that I got Sherlock Holmes' Crimes and Punishments for free on Epic a while back. Back. I might have to check that out and see if maybe Frogware stuff is a niche I didn't know I was into. If you want to try Sinking City out for yourself, you can get it on Games Planet through their website for a reasonable price, the PS5 online store, or the Nintendo Switch eShop where it's like 12 bucks the last time I checked. It's going to be a little odd installing the game on PC through a means that isn't a major storefront, but the download worked just fine for me. I'd give this one a recommend if you're into the Cthulhu mythos or just mystery solving in general. So that's going to do her for today. Special thanks again to my sponsor. Opera GX, and all the patrons. If you'd like to support this channel and get early access to videos, 4K cat clips, uncut versions of commentary videos, and much more, head over to patreon.com slash charlatanwonder where you can get all of that and more. Shout out to my $10 patrons, American Hoagie, Baby Smasher, Bam Bam Toxico, Brandon B, Carl with a K, Chili Moon Buns, Danger Guy, Dead Negator, Destitute, Douglas Black, Epic Fail, Eric T, Forbidden Snack, French Toast, Nice Shorts, Griffin U, Jason Breen, Johan K, Neko the Brave, Niles D, Elisa Nera, Paul D, Palindus J, Richard H, Schlingding, Soviet D, Turtle, Spectate, Technica, T Jard, Thomas G, Tor H, and Yannick Z. In the meantime, stay safe, stay indoors, wash your hands and wear a mask, and practice social distancing when you need to go out, and enjoy this cat video. Boy, we got the big stretchy on the box. Oh yeah, I'm just filling the boy on the box. Yeah, I had to get a new bed frame because ours busted. But then uh, we're about to move soon, so we figured, you know, uh, may as well just uh, keep it disassembled until we get there. Flufu has appreciated this. He practically, he lives on this thing now. He stretches on it, he sits on it, he wobbles on it. This feels overly zoomed in. Nope, that is as far out as it zooms. Scritchies. Oh, 
Oh. Now it's not cool to be on the box anymore because I'm here. Fine. Be that way. <laughs> <laughs>